All right, welcome. We are live tonight <laughs> on Friday night, and we have some special guests in the house tonight. Loving audio, we have Miss USA Today best-selling author Kenya Wright and <laughs> award-winning Eric Michael Summer, narrator of over four hundred books now. <laughs> oh yeah, they keep adding well, up. Wow. <laughs> So welcome, guys. I am so excited to be here tonight and chatting with you guys. So Kenya, we're going to start off with your bio. Who is Kenya Wright? Kenya Wright is a USA Today bestselling author of over 70 novels, which I know it's more than that now, <laughs> for, you, for her 10-year career. She focused on increasing the presence of diverse characters in romance fiction. She also writes mysteries that touch on societal problems. Her books have been sold all over the world and published in print, ebook, and audio. In between full-time writing, she homeschools her three children and they live a nomadic lifestyle, traveling and connecting with amazing people all over the world. And that being said, Ms. Kenya, tell us where you are tonight. <laughs> I'm in <laughs> Toronto, um, oh. Canada right now. Yeah, yeah. Last month oh. we was in Jamaica, and that was cool. Now we are we were chilling in, on the beach, and now we are nice and chilly up okay. in Toronto. <laughs> you have any snow? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know. I was following your page on. Um, when you were in Jamaica and you guys were doing everything. I'm like, look at them Relaxing. living that life. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the goal for next year, the goal um February is Japan. That is the goal. Oh yeah. I love Japan. Oh my never been. Never, never, never been. Ooh. I'm excited. Have you oh, planned wow. a trip where where do you want to visit? I'm still, I'm looking at Tokyo, but I think Tokyo would um, end up being like a, a week maybe. And then I'm looking at um, Osaka to stay for like three weeks or so. Wow. I may have to ask you some tips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kyoto is also an excellent city. A, a really good me mixing of old and new. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, Tokyo is a really big, bustling New York style, yes. multicultural uh, experience. And Osaka mm -hmm. is also fantastic. But Kyoto is probably my favorite city in Japan. <gasps> Okay. Um, okay. I'm putting, I'm writing that down in Kyoto. Yes. Okay. All right. That, that wow. may be it then. Yeah. Cause I <laughs> want to sit somewhere and write. So as, as well as like explore. So yeah. Kyoto. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. Kenya. Cause that leads into our story tonight, which is redemption yes. and Yoshiro is from Japan. <laughs> so <laughs> Let's get started with the questions. I know everybody's here. So hi guys. We got Dana. Hey Clarice. everybody. Hey Dana, Clarice. How y'all doing? <laughs> we have another user that I don't see her name. So <laughs> <laughs> but we're excited. So Kenya, tell us how you came up with the character Yoshiro. And is he based on anyone in particular in your life? Oh my God, I wish he was. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I was supposed to be working on uh, my Line and Mouse series, which is pretty popular. But mm -hmm. in the midst of that, I just, you know, it was coming up to be fall. And I just, I had saw like the equalizer and, mm -hmm. you know, just like somebody was playing it while I was writing one day and I just got like really wrapped up in it. And I started thinking of how, you know, I love the idea of this guy who can fight and do all of these things but then also, you know, helps out this woman who like really, really needs her help, right? And, you know, so that was like kind of the initial thing that started Redemption Off, right? Okay. Yeah. So now you normally write BWWM. So what mm -hmm. made you make Yoshiro a Japanese man? Um, I don't think we have enough, which why this year this upcoming year i'm going to be writing more um asian heroes so i i just love the idea of um just okay so my big thing has been men of all races just you know black asian hispanic whatever just all just ravishing black women <laughs> so 
that is even though I've been sticking like with Russian and all of these different my goal has been like all races. I have a, a Morocco book coming out and then of course oh. Japan and, and right now I'm working on um uh Chinese. It's ended up being a trilogy. I thought it was only gonna be one book, but so that's really why he ended up being Japanese. I don't think we see it a lot and I like to explore that. I also like the culture, the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I was really into it. So, you know, that's one of the biggest uh, things. Awesome. It <laughs> really translates that you did your research. I love the part yeah. where you put in about the Christmas, how they celebrate Christmas and they eat mm -hmm. fried, Kentucky fried chicken or fried chicken. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> that blew my mind. I'm like, okay, go Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> now, with um, that being said, Eric, you really brought Yoshira's character to life. Yes. So can you tell us how you came up with the way you read him? And, you know, I know Kenya wrote him very well. How did you translate her writing? I mean, one of the first challenges is to sort of vibe with, with the author's cadence for a character. Uh, you know, a good author is going to write someone's speech in a way that makes it easy for me, me to make those decisions of how mm -hmm. he sounds. Um, and so just as I was reading through the book, I have to read through before recording. Wow. Um, I'm taking notes. I can write down what I wrote. I think I wrote down deep voice <laughs> and, and age range. Um, but I didn't have to write down a lot because okay, okay. a lot of those decisions came through just the way he was written. Oh, and wow. and knowing that I I think I went for a more measured cadence. He's a mm. thoughtful character, yes. um, and and sort of a haunted character because of his past. Yes. Um, and so I didn't have to write down a lot in my notes because it mm -hmm. all just sort of came together in my head as I was wow. getting ready to do it. And because um, he's the one that's going to speak the most, I sort of want to keep him as close to my standard speaking range as possible and yes. so that i try and go for just small changes so that Perfect. that character comes through um you know i i have to say one thing so my friend my bestie was reading was listening to the audiobook um to redemption and it's the scene where it's like a shower scene and it's like mm. masturbation all this stuff <laughs> happening in it and she stops like that scene so many people have come up to me about how well that's that shower scene is hmm. she stops the chapter and begins to go on to um what's the dating app i can't think of it right now whatever it is tinder, <laughs> tinder and she's searching for japanese guys <laughs> <laughs> like, walks me up and in the morning she's like kenya i was on tinder for like no it's bumble that's what it was with okay bumble. she's like i've been on bumble for two hours searching for somebody that's kind of like your cheryl just after that she's like do you know who did the audio but i was like not to the point where i can like set y'all up like girl <laughs> <laughs> but that's how great you did that scene so well, shout out to you on that <laughs> excellent thank you <laughs> okay now <laughs> that being said can you <laughs> eric how do you prepare for um some of the steamy scenes that kenya wrote because she can write a sex scene. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I mean, it. I've, I've done one or two of these at this point. So um, it really, it is just like any other scene, mm -hmm. playing the emotion of the scene. Okay. Um, okay. And, and trying to ground it as much into the moment and what these characters are feeling. Mm. Uh, and, and just staying, I almost have to put the blinders on. I have a... Uh, <laughs> I, I have an engineer mm -hmm. that, that runs the board and makes sure I'm reading things correctly. So there is a coworker on the other side of the glass. Oh my God. Um, and, and those are the scenes. I end up making very few mistakes in those scenes because I am so focused. You're like. On, on just, <laughs> I'm just trying to stay in the moment and not think about, these are the words I am now saying. Mm -hmm. I am this character and this is what these characters are feeling right now. Um, occasionally, the children are home from school. On oh. one of those days, and and oh. so my engineer has to have the volume at just the right level that Very he can well. still hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the kids can't. 
Um, and that's that's an extra fun challenge for those scenes. It, but it's all about the blinders. It's staying in the moment um, and, and making it as true as possible. Awesome. I, I have a question. And I, I, I know I'm not to interview her right here. Girl, but but free. <laughs> is, is there ever a point where you've read a sex scene and in any of your books, since you've done so many, where you're like, whoa, this, this author is crazy. Like you ever had... And he's like, whoa, you try to choke this me. person is nasty. Like, <laughs> oh my God. Um, I mean, all of these stories come from different perspectives and they certainly speak to different audiences. Um, mm -hmm. And there is certainly a sense that, um, that some characters or authors have mm -hmm. a particular uh, perspective on their, their <laughs> love scenes um, that I would not necessarily agree you know, go with or, or yeah. be entertained by. Um, but that is, again, this is what this character is, is uh, emphasizing, or this author is emphasizing. And, yeah. and this is what's what's going on. Occasionally, I have like, I'll, I try and communicate with the other narrator in the okay, narration. Okay. Um, and we have had a couple that we say, I don't really agree with the way that these characters are being presented. I just don't yeah, feel yeah, yeah. great about them. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's just at we have to do the job um, Ooh, and, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and we try and again, make it as authentic as possible, but we have had a couple of, uh, rap sessions at the end. We're just <laughs> like, this is a little beyond this the line for crazy. me. I, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the alpha male characters can just go a little too far yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, if they're not grounded in a real emotion and they're just being a jerk for some reason, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'll still do it, but, it, I'm not feeling great about it by the time it's over. Um, wow. Are you shocked by what's popular sometimes? In I, I don't I don't get to listen to much uh, beyond mm -hmm. what I'm already working on. So I only know the small sections of the genre that I'm working on at any particular mm -hmm. moment. And then I'll, I'll find out that some other subgenre is extremely popular. And oh, wow. I have no idea that that is, you know, there's so many nooks and crannies in the world of romance mm -hmm. um, that all have very enthusiastic fan bases. Yeah. Uh, and, and are all, you know, all terrific, legitimate, uh, you know, storytelling venues. Mm -hmm. But I'm not aware of all of them. Um, so sometimes <laughs> I'm surprised when I'll get a particular story and turn a corner and go, oh, 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 this is what, this we're, is doing. what we're doing today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now can you get back to uh, our characters? Who inspired Ebony? Because she seems like somebody I know. So I would say too, because this is what I, I sometimes, it's such a long story, but there was a, the other part of why I write World Redemption was, you know, there was a thing of a, a situation of I was in Thailand, the kids was with my ex, there was a whole emergency with that that I didn't appreciate. I had to fly to the States, get them, and then we flew to Puerto Rico and I had them, but I felt so aggravated, I guess, with the situation. And so there was a merging, and I was so aggravated that I couldn't finish the line of the mouse. So it was a merging of me doing sort of a, um, a healing situation. I forgot the word for this when you write and it's uh, cathartic. cathartic. It was a cathartic situation where it's like I mashed up a lot of things. So like her ex, Ebony's ex, which is abusive and all that, mm -hmm. it comes from, because I had two ex-husbands, so it comes from the first ex-husband that was kind of abusive but didn't have kids with. And then yet the second ex-husband is the one I had kids with but upset at the time with. So it's like I want to kill him. <laughs> like I ate them for pigs, but I cannot do that because I'm showing the kids a very healthy parent co-parenting relationship. But I'm gonna kill them in this book though. Okay. And, <laughs> and also I wanted to so there's a lot of things in there that are from my life, like the whole place where it's set in Washington, mm. the house, the setup, the whole town is real. Um the pig, the neighbor that has a pig farm that's a little suspicious and people are driving in the middle of the night and you're like, hmm, I wonder, maybe, you know, because we're <laughs> off the grid in Washington, the snow. There's this moment in the book where it talks about how 
Yashiro had bought the um, property over from a, a, a woman who had a restaurant on there that mm -hmm. was real about this property. And they talk about the peanuts. Wow. That was real where there was a people just throughout the, the week would come and say, hey, is the restaurant open? And I, I would always say, no, it's not. And they're like, do you have the peanut soup recipe? And we were like, no, it's like at least two to three times a month to the point wow. where me and some of the owners were searching for the peanut soup recipe. We're like, what, it, you know, we never found it. But so a lot of that stuff was involved in the book. So I, so Ebony is as much, close, Ebony and then there's a character from When the Smoke Clears, this book called When the Smoke Clears. Those two characters are the most me. And even the kids in the book, are very similar mm. to to the kids. You know, it's how we move, we're a unit. And I feel like sometimes I'm running from toxicity or craziness <laughs> and, and how we're very gripped up. If we deal with people, we're all linked. Like when, when they first get to Yashiro's house and Yashiro's like, hey, y'all can come through or y'all can come. And they're like, no, nah, no. we're over here. <laughs> I don't know what y'all doing, but we're here. <laughs> and, you know, they go in the room, the door's locked up, you know, everything's in front of the door. So that's as close to me as possible for the book. But of course, she's much more together than uh, than I am. So that's where awesome. that came from. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't that believe relationship that part. with the kids was one of the mm -hmm. things that most interested me when I first started reading this. Wow. Um, uh, I really loved the way that that relationship felt real. Oh, um, I always love when there are some good kid characters that yes. get a relationship with the uh, the main character. There's sometimes the breaking point. They mm -hmm. end up warming uh, to the gentleman before the the main oh, yeah. female, um, and it, it just felt like so much fun. And that relationship, that close knit, we yeah. look out for each other. Uh, it it felt really good and, and authentic, and and it really helped to define who wow. these people were. Mm -hmm. um, and it made those characters a lot easier to get a grip on. That's cool because I typically don't usually have kids in a book. It's only a few times because kids can sometimes get in the way of the story and the plot line and the sex scenes and all of that. <laughs> yeah. But it was important for me to have kids in this one. And it's why it ends up being like one of my first like slow burns because it takes them a minute to link up. She's a mom. She's got her kids there. She don't know this guy. She's running from an abusive relationship. She's not about to just hook up with this guy like within the week, you know. So it was fun bringing the kids in. So thanks for saying that for sure. It definitely um, is one of the reasons I love the book because of the relationship mm -hmm. that is built within the kids and then the way Yoshiro, you know, he interacted with the kids. Yeah. I was like, wow you really want a stepfather to interact with the kids like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking of, one of my questions was, how did you come up with love is like a flower? When Kia was asking Yoshira about love and men and how they think about love. Oh, I have no idea now. <laughs> <laughs> It was 2019. <laughs> it sounded like a poem or something. I'm like, does she write poetry? <laughs> I mean, I did long ago. I don't know if the poetry was good. I'm going to keep it real, being that I never became a poet. Um, I don't know. I'm just, now you make me want to read it again. <laughs> I could have came up with something, but I, I just, I'm not good at doing it. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I saw a flower and I was writing. <laughs> you know, I'm so deep. Maya Angelou. <laughs> I'm so deep when I see flowers and I see, you know, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't know how that, that came about. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's honest and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was so happy I could, could kill my ex and, and feed him to the pigs. Girl. I was like, that's when the love, you know. <laughs> I really love that scene. By and the way. he loves this book, by the way, too. He's like, second, second book that you killed me, and this is the favorite one. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. well, our reader says it made it more realistic, and she loved that. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, thanks for saying that. Okay, so Eric, you told us a little bit about how you got started before we 
came became live can you go into detail about how you just started narrating because yeah. you really do a great job so uh i went to school for television radio film uh mm-hmm. with with the goal of working as a muppeteer um <gasps> i really wanted to work with the muppets and that yeah. ended up not working out uh Although I did intern for them, I was uh, in New York for a small oh period of time, goodness. doing some work with with the Jim Henson Company and that sort of thing. Wow. But uh, the the second uh, job was to enter radio. So I was uh, on a classical music station in Hartford, Connecticut, called mm-hmm. Beethoven.com. It was one of the the first uh, internet radio stations uh, that was trying to play classical music to the world, and mm-hmm. I was the morning guy and music director there for for several years. Um, and that led to doing some voiceover work because if you work at a radio station, you have to do voiceover work for the station. It's just sort of mm. the way it works. Um, and the more of that I did, the more I really, really enjoyed it. Really? And, uh, and so I started taking more seminars and classes and recording demos and, and taking more of those jobs. And eventually the day-to-day of the radio station was getting in the way of doing the voiceover work. Oh, And okay. so I... I, in 2004, I took the plunge and went full-time voiceover work. Uh, and soon after that, I had been getting an audiobook demo out, and it happened to be when Audible was trying to expand their roster of oh people. Oh, my gosh. So you got a, a new... when it was shooting up. Yes. Uh, they had oh. just opened up a new facility in Newark, New Jersey, and they were looking to expand their roster. And I happened to be there at the right time, and they liked what they heard. So I st- started doing maybe one book a month Mm -hmm. uh, at first and doing other jobs on the side. And it just started adding and adding and adding. And eventually I filled up my schedule with audiobooks. And and now it's almost all audiobooks. I'll do the occasional other voiceover job. Um, But it's in all sorts of genres, not just romance. I do a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, uh, some nonfiction. I've done a history of Japan. uh, So I knew some of the background uh, information. uh, it's just a blast. Every book is a little bit different. Yeah. So yeah. it's always a, there's always some sort of challenge uh, to, to make it interesting each time I go. It's, it's a blast. I love it. How many books do you do like each week? Like, is it a certain amount or? I can get about, it's all about how long the book is eventually. So I can get about two and a half hours done of final mm-hmm. audio in a day. Okay. So that's, okay. that's usually my planning. So if it's a 10 hour book, that's going to take me most of the week, four days in the okay. studio. Um, and then I've got a big calendar that just has post-it flags all over it. This is how long it's going to take me to get this book done. Wow. Uh, and, and I try and plan it out as best I can. Sometimes the text is more difficult than expected and it takes me longer. Or sometimes I breeze right through. I make very few mistakes. And the, it's just a much easier uh, you know, narration to get through. The characters all make sense and the text all just flows. And uh, you know, I, I end up with some extra time in the afternoon. But I try and plan it out, which is one of the things I like about doing audiobooks is mm-hmm. I can plan everything out very well. I know that on these dates I'm recording this book and I can prepare for it and know what, what is on my plate that day yeah. and, and be ready for it. So you're saying you have to be very organized as an audiobook narrator. <laughs> as I was saying, I have notebooks or, or binders full of these. This is These are the notes for your book, Kenya. Wow. Um, that is so crazy. I have written down every character. Anytime somebody speaks, I write down yeah. the, uh, the the title or, of the character. And then any physical attributes, like it for Yoshiro, deep voice, mid 30s, <laughs> six foot two. Um, and then I go back through and figure out what they all sound like. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and try and come up with voices that are going to be, uh, a good matches for each other. So Mm -hmm. if there's someone that's going to be having conversations a lot, uh, I want to make sure they have as differing a voice as possible so that it's very clear who's talking. Um, and then the tricky part is sometimes it's a book series and the next book doesn't come for six months to a year. year. You have to go in the filing cabinet over here and then the next book comes along and I have to pull the notes back out. Do you listen sure to the, the book again? Not the entire book. I will mm-hmm. often try and get, uh, if I know it's going to be a series, I'll try and get clips of the major okay, characters. Okay. Um, often if I have forgotten to do that and, and didn't do it in the heat of the moment, I will go back to the previous book. I save the recordings. Um, and so I can go back and clip those characters if they're showing up in the next book, um, oh. which, which certainly helps. But if I know it's a series, I will do my darndest to make his make my life as easy as possible to have short little clips of them talking so I can just 
very quickly remind myself what everyone sounds like. I have another question and then I'll <laughs> let you do your thing. Oh, I, what can an author do to make it easier? Like when I'm putting together a story and stuff like that, what can an author do? Like, what do you wish authors knew in order to make the audiobook easier? Am, am I saying that correctly? Like, no, I yeah. think I, it's a good question uh, because some, some authors have uh, done a lot of prep work and have provided that along with what they give to the audiobook producers. Mm -hmm. And so I end up seeing those things. Um, pronunciations are always helpful mm -hmm. uh, depending on how, uh, I, I, I don't recall having too much of a difficulty with redemption. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody was pretty clearly uh, described and, and the words were, you know, it was all good. Um, but occasionally there's a pronunciation that you can read a name many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and if the author is able to say, this is how this should be pronounced, uh, or just to provide contact information that says, hey, if you have any questions, here's how you get a hold Ooh, of me. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. But as to being as descriptive as possible in the text is always helpful. Uh, oh. But then if, if when you send off materials to an audiobook producer and say, here are my main characters, here's what I was thinking about what they sound like, mm -hmm. uh, it just gets people on the, the same page. Yeah. I have had authors when I've asked questions like that, who said, I don't know. I'm really not yeah. sure what that what that should be pronounced like. Mm -hmm. uh, I intended this word to be unpronounceable. So oh, wow. <laughs> good luck. Um, oh. That's your job. You figure that out. <laughs> so just having an author that knows that these words are going to be spoken aloud mm -hmm. uh, and, and is willing to say, I thought about this. This is how I'd like this. This is how it's said in my head. Yeah. And, and, and giving that along, whether it's early in the process or late in the process, having that sort of feedback is really important. I wow. like that. OK, thank great. you so much. That's really great. Yeah. Now, thank you for sharing all of that, because we have people in the audience that are trying to become narrators. So oh, wow. I, I know Clarice for real really wants to do that. So I'm hoping that's helping her. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now Kenya, for the people that want to be authors in the audience, <laughs> tell us how you get started writing and do you outline? Do you just go by the seat of your pants? What is it? What does your writing process look like? Um, I used to do be just go by the seat of my pants, but now I'm a serious outliner. I like to oh. spend three, four, maybe even a week putting together the outline. And I like to put Easter eggs inside the story. So like sometimes when the couple, like for now in, in Lay's story that I'm working on, there's a, um, a divider and it has all of these images in each panel. And the panel and the images in the panel are actually moments that are gonna happen in the future of the story. Yeah. But I, you can't do that unless you really outline and sit there and think, like write the outline out. Then the next day, chill, take a bath, come back and say, oh, no, 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 and this and that. And then, you know, to put the clues in. I like when there's tiny clues going in throughout the story. And then at the end, you're like, oh, it's blah, blah, blah. And I should have known because of da, 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 right? Right. So big outliner. And I think taking that time, taking that at least week to sit there and meticulously um, outline with like heavy strategy on blowing the reader's mind, right? Is the way to then go ahead and get into the writing and working out. And it's still not an easy situation. It's still moments where you're like, what was, where was I going with this? That doesn't make any sense. Let me go that way. But the outline for me is the biggest, biggest thing. So that's how I usually, uh, start a book. Okay. Awesome. And we have a comment that says foreshadowing is a great tool. So maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why your books are so good because Yay. I might have to start the outlining thing because I do oh, a yeah. loose outline and I'm like, ugh. It no, just it's crazy. <laughs> no, I, I have all types of charts and all types. I get a little crazy, but you could totally message me or ask me any questions or anything like that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, 
in the book, you, the Yoshua has two dogs, and the names salt are pepper. Salt and Pepper. <laughs> well, I know who they're named after. Mm-hmm. Well, how did that pop in your head? <laughs> I don't know why. You know what? I think the biggest thing is I definitely know that I wanted him to. He was so such a sad character initially, right? Mm-hmm. He's on his own. He's lost his family. He's hiding from like the the mafia and all of that. I wanted to give him somebody to make it so he won't be a complete crazy recluse, right? Mm-hmm. And so him having the the two dogs was just a lot of fun. But then I didn't realize that um and I should do more dogs in in future books. They <laughs> it ended up being fun for them for him explaining, you know, oh, salt and pepper, you know, and, and him looking <laughs> like a nerd, you know, in front of the kids. But then right. of course the kids loving the two dogs and mm-hmm. of course them being the bridge that, you know, especially the youngest kid who was, you know, had the most trauma and wasn't talking. The the dogs being that that situation that bridges all of them together. So um, it was a lot of fun having them have uh, salt and pepper. And him realizing I probably lost my dogs now. They're like the kids' dogs now. And I thought that was like cute too. So. Yeah. And the way they did the little dances on command, that was so cute. <laughs> I love those dogs. I'm like, I want to play with them. <laughs> that was awesome. So now we have. Had- but there's oh. one more thing, and then oh then I was. While I'm writing it, because again, we're in Puerto Rico, there's a husky next door. And I don't know why anybody would have a husky in Puerto Rico. But what I thought was interesting about this dog is whenever his people would leave, he would just groan all day. And as soon as they would come, he would get so excited and (laughs) jump around and he's just having a blast. But during the day, you know, my kids would start to go out there and like play with them a little in the backyard and stuff like that. But it just, because I'm writing and that's going on, I think that's how it slips in to these dogs <laughs> end up getting in the story. So that was like one little thing. Well, thank goodness for that dog because that was a great part of the story. <laughs> it was a great way for the kids to connect. And I yeah. loved, I loved how the baby, baby girl started talking because of her feeling confident with the dogs there. Exactly. Yeah. And also a good way to bring out Yoshiro's heart. Uh, Ooh, you know, you, know you, you see the way he interacts with the dogs yes. and and how that's when he is in full loving mode. Mm, and you yes. know that he is then capable of that instead that. of the surly personality that, you know, the outward appearance. But then you yeah, see his real sense. self in the way he deals with the dogs <laughs> at first and then starts to do that with the kids. It, it's it's an it's a way to break through that wall and again yeah. gives me more information about who, who he is. is. Oh wow. Yeah, so now I'm gonna have more pets in the more pets, more kids. Yeah. More pets, more kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I love that. I love that. <laughs> now, one other element you had in there was the strip club. And mm. to me, the strip club was like its own little life, <laughs> yeah, yeah. its own little world. How, why, first of all, why was there the strip club mm-hmm. that his buddy worked in and the girls all wanted Yosher and he was like, I ain't thinking about yeah. that, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> why is he there? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a big oversharer um, <laughs> in interviews. <laughs> So in my 20s, I stripped very badly for three months and then just gave it up. I was a horrible stripper. It wasn't <laughs> because stripping really deals with the, the mental game. Mm-hmm. And it's not just dancing. It's like the, it's a hustle and it's a, how to get in their heads. And it's very cutthroat, at least this, this club. But this club, I remember that I worked at because I was a, I was um, a sociology major in college and it was summertime and stuff. And I thought it would be easy money. It was not. So I just ended up like doing some political canvassing job because I was like, this sucks. But I remember this one guy that would come in and it's always stuck with my mind. He must have been 65. His wife had passed away and he would always dance with her. He was a dance instructor that retired. And so he would come in that club to just pay the girls to dance salsa. 
and do all the stuff. He would do the turns. He would do the, that's all. He would come in <laughs> hour and a half in a strip club, a strip club <laughs> suited up, fly, and he would just da -da 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 do all of the stuff and everything, have a glass of wine, and then he was out of there. No intention, <laughs> you know, of anything else. Just like, I will give you $100 to dance with me. Okay, wow. let's go. And I just always thought that, and you know, you could tell, he, then he talk about his wife sometimes too. And I thought that was like the coolest, you know, thing. And it always sat with me. So when it was time for you, Shira, to come in, I liked the idea that, you know, I wanted the reader to understand that, like, he's not just about, you know, what the, it's going to take a lot more than a naked woman for him to just, you know, jump through it. He's been through a lot. He doesn't care. He's just there for his tea and to hang with his friend, you know? <laughs> and I thought it was such a funny thing. It, it makes him so interesting that he's sipping tea at the strip club. Right. Girls are like, hey, and the girls are like, hey, come on through because he's the one dude that has not, he's a regular that has not like connected. And that's how it was with this guy. People were competing now. They were, some of them, not me, I was just happy to dance. But some will compete like, I'm going to get him to like, like me because he's, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> he's really just about this, I'm coming to dance. And you know, think about it this way. How many times could he just go out to a park or something and be like, hey, would you just dance with me for an hour? Most women are going to be like, get away from me. Right. Weird old man, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought that was like a great, great um, addition, you know, for sure. For awesome. um, him. <laughs> and I love that he drank his chai tea. <laughs> oh, like, wow. tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they said how the strip club was used for socioeconomic lesson for the oh kids. Oh my now. god, <laughs> yes, that was so funny. I was like, okay, she. I mean, you had to explain it, so you might as well do it the right way. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to start with the rapid fire questions. I'm just going to ask the questions. You give me the first thing that pops into your heads. All right. So if you could have any author's books in your library, mm. and it was just one author to fill up your entire library, who would it be? Holy cow. Oh, this is a really <laughs> sick question right here because <laughs> so many people. I guess I'd have to say... Oh, that's not fair. I'm going to just cheat. I'm going to say. <laughs> the, the, the first person that popped I, in your head. No, man, that's not fair. I, I'm going to, I'll say Stephen King since I'll have hmm. a whole library full of stuff. Okay. But that's just not right. I want, I have a whole <laughs> list of people I want on, <laughs> on there. <laughs> my my first thought was to say Douglas Adams, but he didn't write that many. Like that's yeah, pretty much the Hitchhiker's yeah. Guide, and that's it. So I I think I'd have to go with Terry Pratchett, uh, the Discworld author. He has such a wide variety of novels in that world, and and a lot of really great social commentary. Yes, and yes. So just varying stories in that world. I think I would not be bored if I had Terry Pratchett's works in the library. Awesome. Well, a little did didn't Douglas do the Dirk Gently or did I get who did Dirk Gently? You're right, he did Dirk Gently's Holistic still, Detective Agency. It's not like Terry Pratt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not Pratchett, but yes. Yeah. See, my thing is I will read I read everything, nonfiction, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, all that. Although I love horror because I see horror writers, especially the guys, as like the bad boys of, <laughs> of the publishing industry. I see them as like, you know. The Fonzie sort of jacket. <laughs> the weird thing. I said that when I have my next man, he's going to be a horror author. Like, y'all are going to see. Oh, wow. See, you know, I'm going to the horror conference next year strictly to just be out there and be single and mingle. They're going to be like, hey, you're a romance author? Yeah. You brought your books? Nope. I'm just here to meet. I you just want to meet some horror authors. <laughs> Who was single up in here? Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> just romance author at the, the horror convention, just living my best life next year. That's mm -hmm. that is the plan. <laughs> I need you to go live on that one. I <laughs> need to follow it. <laughs> well, all my readers would be so confused. Why is she at that horror conference? 
<laughs> Checking out the, the, the single guy. Doing research. <laughs> So speaking of, if you could write any other genre than what you write, mm -hmm. what would it be? Oh, man. Mystery. Oh, okay. Watch, watch me cheat again. Cyberpunk <laughs> horror mystery. I've just mashed. What? My <laughs> a mash up. Uh -uh. Yeah. But a really good cyberpunk. But I feel like cyberpunk tends to have mystery in it anyway. It's very neo noir sci fi, very dark world. I would do something like that. Okay. Yeah. And Eric, what, since you don't write, what is your favorite genre to read? I think if I had to choose, uh, science fiction is is my favorite. I love the play space that authors can have by doing something that's near future or even yes. distant future and getting to play with social norms and having Ooh. alien creatures that don't even mesh with our way of thinking. And yeah. you can so explore in this world. And there's you know new sci-fi, classic sci-fi, military sci-fi. I There's just so much there. Uh, to play oh with my gosh. Like yeah, I knew you were gonna say that because I looked at your website and most of your books are like sci-fi. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he loves sci-fi. <laughs> it's it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sci-fi is amazing, especially when you look at somebody like I. I was telling my kids about Octavia Butler mm. and how a lot of her books that I read in the '90s, like she had this book and, and it was like maybe 1989 or 1990, whatever. But the book talked about how, you know, there was this big, you know, pandemic sort of situation mm -hmm. and people couldn't go out. Well. So everyone had to be in. And her, the father, the, the, the girl, the heroine's father was teaching school to like students and it was on a computer and all of this stuff like that. And I remember thinking that could never be the world like teaching. <laughs> <laughs> like her mind is like explosive. Like I remember and like everybody communed on the computer. And at the time, computers weren't like right. the internet's not really happening during that time. So for me, sci-fi authors are just like fortune tellers. Mm -hmm. You know, what they imagine either inspires the inventor or something, somebody's getting inspired, basically. But what's fascinating to me with some of these classic sci-fi tales is yeah. the things that they get right are always amazing. Like, oh, yeah. wow, you saw this coming. But there are other things that the author never even imagined that this would change. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur C. Clarke wrote a book called Childhood's End, which okay, I narrated okay. a long time ago. Um, but there, they talked about all this you know, fascinating future stuff, but one element of the technology that was still around in whatever future date this was, was mm -hmm. magnetic tape. Ooh. And he, everything was real to real and tape oh, so yeah. and was doing that. And he just didn't even think that having anything beyond magnetic recording tape. devices was possible. And yeah, now yeah. children today have no idea what a magnetic tape no, looks like. No, um, no. And it's, I find those little quirks really interesting beyond just the, oh, you, you predicted this amazing thing. Great. Yes. But you also totally had a blind spot. You for tell us, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's like it's like the flying car with Back to the Future. Right. It's like, hey, man, it's 2023. I should already have this. No that flying was the cars. most exciting part. Where's my flying car? <laughs> right. Where's my flying like skateboards. I know they exist, but not to the public, you know. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> My sisters used to pick on me when I, because I'm the youngest in the family. Back mm -hmm. at, when I was little, they were all always so much older than me. Oh, by the time you graduate, you're going to have a flying car. And they thought it was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> now, if you could be writing partners with anyone, who would you choose? And it doesn't have to just be one. Oh, oh, that's a really good one. No one's ever asked me that. And this is a problem with me because I always want to write with people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it never comes, works out or whatever. Um, me and Keita kind of started a biker Ooh. thing, but it didn't like work out completely. And I, and it was my fault. I just didn't know where it was going, but we had a little biker. It was biker hero and a 
funeral home chick who's like hiding the body sort of oh thing. Oh my God. Um, Don't tell me that because now I want y'all to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to Theodore Taylor a lot. Mm. I'm, I'm all the time now. And I want, I would love to do just anything. She could just tell me what to do and I'll just be like, okay. And what are you, what are, you know, I'll be her little writing bitch, basically. <laughs> um, Rena Kent is, you know, outside of IR, but I love how she does bully. Um, who else? Of course, Stephen King, because I love Stephen King. Mm. Um, yeah, I can't think of any more right now, but there's so many where it's like, I would love to, um, to jump in there and get with them. Awesome. Now, Eric, same for you, only who would you <laughs> choose to narrate with? I'm I'm pretty lucky because I get to work with so many other talented uh, actors, narrators, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the romance genre. Most of my books in romance are dual narration, but I don't get to interact with them very much. There's a certain Ooh. amount of planning. There's uh, you know, there's emails back and forth. There are sound samples that we exchange back and forth as we're mm -hmm. nailing some of these characters down. But I have not been able to do a duet narration where Ooh, I'm actually interacting with with the the other person, uh, more like a radio drama or mm. or something like that. And to get mm -hmm. that immediate feedback would be really really fun. Yeah. If I had to pick. A, a person that I haven't had a chance to work with. I'd love to work with Felicia Day, not necessarily in romance, yeah. but just in something. Yeah, um, yeah, she's, yeah. She seems like so much fun and mm -hmm. she's done some Audible projects in the past. Uh, wow. recently, actually. She would be a lot of fun to work with. Awesome. Now, I have a question because I always have questions. Mm -hmm. um, I love, obviously I love duet narration. Duet is that, that narration for people who um, are listening. It's when, you know, even though the male is saying the well, even though the female is narrating that chapter, or oh, the male is going to say all of right. the parts, like when they're talking, you know. So it's that performance element. To me, it's like when you hear duet, it's like you're in a play, mm -hmm. you know. You're listening, but you're you know your eyes are closed. Um, with AI becoming a thing, I feel like publishing companies will start going up to duet because I feel like AI can't, AI can't do that. And it can't do emotional, you know, nuances and all that. But I don't think AI is not going to be able to do duet at this time. And I think that would be a great, you know, um, way for like the game to go up. Do you see publishing companies jumping to duet more or not yet? I don't know necessarily if that's the differentiator. I know that mm. uh, having doing duet, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, again, I haven't done this myself. Yeah, if you're yeah. going to e either the two narrators are recording separately and then it's an editing nightmare to put them together. Ooh. Or you have them both online at the same time and mm. having to do a real radio play. Yeah, uh, yeah, with with the jumping in on each other's lines, which is more efficient in the long run, but costs more because you have to have both actors there at the same mm. time. Um, I think the differentiator right now, if you're talking about you know separating yourself from AI, is is just that same emotion that you know whether it's one wow. narrator or two separate or a duet or a full cast, the real people behind those storytelling voices yes. are what is going to differentiate you from an AI product. I was just you reading know. an article just today about how many AI produced audiobooks have hit the market in the last, I think it's three weeks since oh, Audible wow. allowed since... those products on the yeah, platform. Yeah, yeah. And they're basically flooding the, the pages of new releases, especially in romance. Wow. Um, and it becomes difficult to find human narrated the other ones, yeah, um, yeah. I'm hoping that Audible, right now there's no way to filter those out. You can't just mm -hmm. click a box on the side right. of the screen that says, I would rather humans narrate my audiobook. Yeah, please. yeah. Um, I hope that Audible adds that functionality very soon. Yeah. But I think it's going to take listeners and fans and narrators and authors to come mm -hmm. up and say, hey, we would like at least the option to yeah, say yeah, yeah. humans only in this Which particular means, sphere. Right. Wow. And, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, so listeners, while you're, while you're listening to this, make sure that you're doing that when you're choosing your audiobooks. 
Make sure you, you get providing audible feedback that you don't like AI or you do like AI, whichever your choice mm -hmm. is. And search for human voice or something. They're looking for all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, do you, so do you see AI as possibly creating a problem for this industry or, or no? What do you it, think? It's already creating a problem um, mm -hmm. just in the way that those search results are getting flooded with with uh, you know AI produced products. I think right now, if if you actually put the things right next to each other, you can tell the difference. Easily. Um, and from everything I've read on other Facebook groups, romance fans, audiobook fans, almost universally dislike yeah. these as products. And I don't want to say that they shouldn't exist because for accessibility reasons yes. and all sorts of reasons, they should be available. And yeah. some authors, I totally get it, that mm -hmm. can't afford to hire professionals to or produce the audiobook. This, this looks that. like a good option. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think it it is That's just wrong. universally, subjectively an inferior product. Mm. Um, and, and you need to have people behind this to make your story, to, to give your story the... The, um, uh, respect it deserves. Yeah. You know, if you're going to put all that time and effort into writing a story mm -hmm. and all of the stuff that you talked about, all the real people and, and making these characters real to then hand it to a fake voice. Yeah. Is giving, is doing a disservice to the story you created. And see, uh, I love it. so you don't, but you don't see it because you, you're a sci-fi guy. So you see, how technology changes industries, right? Yes. But you also see how when it comes to, see, this is the first time for me where it I've seen technology change with art, like with writing, with images, now with voice. Usually mm -hmm. it messes with other industries. Yeah. Yes. And, and AI can do so much that yeah. isn't front-facing art. Uh, you can use AI for research. Yeah, you can yeah, use yeah. AI to help you outline things. Fast, but fast. that final push has to be done by the artist. And we're yes. talking, this is this applies for art, for game design, for mm -hmm. all of these other artistic endeavors. If you just throw it all into a computer and take whatever it spits out, that's not really what, what we're trying to do here. Yeah. And uh <laughs> while it saves money in the mm -hmm. short term, it's producing something that's not what yeah. you actually want to see. So I, I don't, I'm going to stay optimistic and think that it's not going to destroy the industry, but exactly. it's going to mess with things for a while. And mm -hmm. until listeners and, and everybody in this sphere says, we're really not happy with what's coming out of these changes. Yeah. It's not going to change. Perfect, perfect. All right. right. Thanks so much for, for touching on that. That's mm -hmm. really, really good. You're right, because you have to hit them in the pocket because if they <laughs> see that it's not making yeah. their money, they yeah. will discontinue it quick, fast, and in yes. a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so. And Al, I want to thank you for doing this because I don't get to talk to the people who narrate my books. So for me, I think that this series is just such a great way to just bring notice to audiobooks and i i love this i i commend you i hope that you keep doing this and i would love to come back awesome sure. and i would love to have you back because you know you're <laughs> one of my faves <laughs> you know that so what is the favorite audiobook you have in your catalog kenya Oh, wow. Well, I mean, 100% redemption just from the fact of how everyone's always coming to me. Like, I get a lot of readers that talk about Redemption's audiobook. And again, people are always talking about the shower scene, which is crazy. Because I didn't think it was going to be that crazy. But I, I went back three different times and listened because it's like, yeah, that, okay. So you really did. <laughs> you did a great job on that. Yeah. <laughs> that is one. And then I love the line in the mouse at the beginning of the series where mm -hmm. we had this particular male actor who just would always, people would say, I want to fly to Russia. And I'm like, I don't think he's Russian though, but okay. <laughs> you know. um, but then he had to go. And I think he ended up doing like voice acting for like animation stuff and everything oh. like that, which is dope. 
you know, so, and he left and there was another person who's good too. But like, I would say the beginning of the uh, Lion and the Mouse. But the other thing is, it's really awkward for me to listen to my own audiobooks. Nah. You know, it's just like, oh my God, I don't know. And I'm like covering myself. And it's just a weird experience. I think, because I want to one day make a movie, right? I think mm -hmm. I'll be one of those persons that can't sit in a theater. Really? Everyone. I think yeah. it, it'll be like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to see it. Just show it to the world, you know? So I don't know. So that's, that's my uh, answer to that. <laughs> wow. So, Eric, what is your favorite audiobook that you've ever narrated? Oh, my goodness. I know it's I not mean, a fair question. Out of 400, so. L, like, Yeah. I yeah, mean, 400 <laughs> books. Um, so, I, all right, I'm going to pick a, a genre we haven't talked about yet is fantasy. Um, and uh, there's a series I did called Benjamin Ashwood. And okay. what the reason why it's one of my favorites is it has what I like to call campfire scenes. Where it's not the it's not an action scene, it's not you know huge dramatic scenes, but they're on a journey, they're on an adventure, yeah. and they've been able to stop and and they're camping for the night, and they all get Whoa. to talk about their next move. They get to talk oh, about what's yeah. how they feel about all of this, and what that does is bring out the characters. Yeah, it's a lot of conversation, it's a lot of back and forth, it's a lot of opportunity for me to really inhabit these people mm. and and get to play those back you know they're interacting i'm talking with this person now i'm talking yeah. with this one now these two are talking and i just love doing those scenes so much that there's plenty of those in benjamin ashwood so oh, I, I have to pick one of those because i just love i love characters i love dialogue i love bringing out those scenes mm. uh, it's hard sometimes when all you get from a character is a quick shouted line from across the room yeah, yeah, yeah. But a campfire scene lets me really dig into these people. Dig into, oh, I like that. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to play around with that just for my stories and put some campfire scenes in. There you go. I don't even think about um, what you were saying with that, but that does allow for all the characters to really connect and emotionally develop. You know, you get to really see their relationships. And those moments make those relationships stronger. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, do you ever, like, go to sleep with the characters in your head or anything like that? You ever dream about an audiobook or anything like that? Usually once I'm out of the booth, I've moved on. <laughs> I'm often working on multiple books at once too. Ooh. So while I'm uh, recording one in the booth, I'm prepping the next one Wow. Um, and, and writing down all the notes. And then I'm also probably doing pickups on mm. the previous or several titles back, uh, or maybe even thinking about the next month's, you know, return to a series and breaking out the notes from that one. If it's one of those complicated mm -hmm. fantasy or sci-fi worlds, I have to figure out how magic works again. And wow. I'm flipping through these pages trying to figure out how that works. Uh, so it, I have to really compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so it's rare that one of these worlds is going to pop up <laughs> when I'm trying to sleep, okay. uh, which I think is maybe fortunate, uh, but it yes. means that I have to focus on each universe while I'm working with it. All right. Do we have, while well, readers, while I'm continuing this, do you, if you have any questions, make sure you put them in the comments. <laughs> so, Kenya, are you a night owl or early bird? Um, I'm a night owl that really desperately wants to be an early bird. I, <laughs> I always want to get up. Like, I love the few times I've been able to get up at five in the morning or six in the morning. It's wow. so amazing. It makes me happy because I have three kids in the, in I homeschool. So mm. I like when they're asleep and I can just do, you know, everyone's asleep too. I like when everyone is asleep and I'm looking at the sun come up and I can write and then I get everything kind of done ish by eight or nine. And I feel really like, like together as a human being for the rest of the day. But that of course doesn't usually happen. I'm like going to sleep one, two, three in the morning. Cause I can't stop writing this chapter. Mm -hmm. I wake up at like 11 or 12 and I'm like, Oh my God, most of the day is gone. And I'm like trying to rush it, you know, but I want to get to um, early morning person. So. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Eric? Uh, I am far more of a morning person. Uh, <laughs> I have to get up early enough to get my kids uh, onto the bus. Yeah. Uh, although they're old enough to do that on their own, I basically 
uh, make sure that everything is in motion. Like okay. occasionally the lights aren't on and I realize <laughs> they've slept through their alarm and that then I have to intervene or they've missed the bus and I have to make sure they get to school. Um, mm -hmm. But then once they're gone, then mm -hmm. I get some productive time Yay. or even relaxation time where I can deal with email and get ready for the recording day. Yeah. But by the time I'm done recording for the day, uh, my brain goes before my voice goes. Ooh. And I am often exhausted after yeah, yeah. a full recording session. And uh, so I am often falling asleep on the couch. Okay. We'll try and stay up to watch <laughs> something. And no, I'm out. Um, and so I I can't be a night owl anymore. I'm, yeah. I'm very much a morning person. Okay. What time do you tend to go to sleep? Uh, well, what time do I intend to go to sleep is closer to 10, 30, 11. Okay, perfect. Um, but I often fall asleep before then <laughs> on the couch. Uh, I'm just laying down. It's it's a little chilly. I get under a blanket and then... And it's, it's just... It's a done deal. Yeah. <laughs> Kenya, what is the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, wow. Best compliment I've ever received. I think it's the ones where the readers tell me how a book has changed their life. That like mm. really helps me out. But like the bigger ones is the ones where it's like, I lost my father. I lost my mother. Like I lost someone and I just read your entire, you know, just binge read your whole s series and that mm. got me out. But my biggest one was um, a reader named Melody who ha did pass um, last year oh. and that really bothered me. But long ago I had had writer's block for a year during my time of divorce. And she messaged me and said, I need you to write again. And I was like, oh, I'm going to divorce. And da, 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 da. She's like, I need you to write again because I am bedridden and I can't leave the bed. And I read all your stories to travel and see the world and do oh. all of this stuff. And I was like, oh man, that like motivated me to write. <laughs> I, you know, and so because at during that time, many, many years ago, I was barely making anything from writing. It was like $200 a month or something like that. So I was like, why am I even doing this? None of this is important, you know? So to get that email from the, from her just really changed my life. So I would say that was the best compliment for me. And it really makes me when I write now, it helps me understand that, you know, um, this is helping someone see something. This is a giving somebody a free vacation that might not be able to afford it. So, you know, Absolutely. you know, so now I see it as all of us from, from narrator re writers, we're all like important. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. And I do live vicariously through you sometimes when you're <laughs> doing your lives. I'm like, look at Kenya out here doing this, <laughs> especially Jamaica, because I love Jamaica. And I'm like, uh, I haven't been able to go in a while. And I'm like, oh, I really need to get, get to Jamaica. <laughs> so how about you, Eric? Uh, well, we were talking before we went live that one of my favorite things is to get to talk to authors uh, whose work I have uh, performed and get mm -hmm. to hear how they respond to it. And it's always good when they're happy with what I've done. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a... a uh, horror series uh, that's set Ooh. in Sleepy Hollow. Ooh. And I recorded the first audiobook before the author was done recording any of the subsequent books. Mm -hmm. And he told me he enjoyed my characterizations of the main characters so much Ooh. that as he was writing the next books, he heard my voice. Oh, yeah. And yes. so I was at, yes. it became a collaborative process that yes. he would send me a book, I would work on it and produce something. And then that he, that helped him inform those characters moving forward, yeah, which I just think is awesome. And and so when he told me that he hears Jason and Joey's voice in in his head wow. when he was writing them, uh, or that I brought to life the grandmother character and it felt like his grandmother, which yeah. was his intent. And yeah. so that is the kind of compliment I just adore hearing because uh, it yeah. means I did a good job and that people are happy with what I've done. Yes, yes. That is a great compliment. <laughs> And Kenya, someone says that they, when they grow up, they want to be just like you. <laughs> <laughs> that is fun. All I right, saw well, a question about um, outlining. Do you have any recommendations for a type of notebook or method for outlining? Um, yeah, so, you know, if y'all ever look at Rick and Morty, 
because I'm like, my kids like kind of dragged me into it. I was like, I don't look at cartoons. And then I started sitting down. And I was like, wow, this is okay. And why are y'all looking at this? Like, that was the other thing. It was like, this, I don't know if y'all should be looking at this. But anyway, I love Rick and Morty. But Dan Harmon um, does it. And he does uh, community and a bunch of other oh. stuff, too. He created the Story Circle, which is just a phenomenal method for outlining. So if you put in YouTube, Dan Harmon, Story Circle, you will come up with all of this great stuff, right? And then also Tyler Mowry which is T-Y-L-E-R space M-O-W-R-Y. I believe that. But he does a whole, like, he has a whole series where he breaks down why a movie or a TV show works, what, what the characters you need, all of the stuff like that. And he shows you clips of the movies. Like, he's not just sitting there talking. He's showing you clips of the movies, how it happens and all that. He also breaks down Dan Harmon's story circle do a lot so it's like one of my big before i start anything i will go and look at that and i will also grab theodore you know i have theodore taylor's um serial fiction no seven figure fiction and okay. it talks about the different steps too so those are like my go-to's and what's funny is theodora loves tyler maori also and also checks it out so those are if you really want to get into outlining and methoding method outlining and figuring out what works in the story, then those are the, the best things to uh, look at. Okay, great. Awesome. And the second part of that question for Eric, mm -hmm. if someone is interested in doing voiceover, where should they start? Whew. So this is always a difficult question for me to answer because I know how I got where I am, but <laughs> everything's very different. I mentioned this was 2005, 2004 yeah. when I when I started doing this. Uh, and so now I'm already, my ball is already rolling. Um, it, it's hard for me to say how to get into this, but talk to as many people as you can, mm -hmm. um, do it. You know, if you're talking about wanting to narrate books, read aloud as much as you can uh, yeah. in front of people, uh, volunteer, uh, to read in front of kids or at senior centers or, you know, something that allows you, has you reading out loud as much as possible mm -hmm. and seek out some professional seminars, classes. Yeah. You don't, now I caution not to spend a ton of money on this because it's entirely possible to do so, okay. but you should do something that gets you in the same room or in the same zoom window as professionals in the industry Wow. that can give you some tips and pointers. That is how I started. I did a seminar in New York City um, with, with folks who produced audiobooks. And wow. you get that feedback and you get some advice. And again, don't then sign up for all of their classes and yeah, spend yeah, yeah. all of your money that you would be trying to earn doing this. But you should start somewhere with, with interaction with professionals uh, and, and get some advice. Do you, do you have to um, apply to audiobook companies with a reel at times? That is the, I mean, you certainly need demo audio of your voice so that yeah. you can market yourself with. Um, that's now, you used to be sending out CDs back when I was starting up, but now <laughs> you're not really, it's all online demos. And uh, that's another reason to do this, practice. you know, practice and then get your get your voice on recording so that you can then market that and get feedback on that from those professionals that I was wow. talking about. Wow. Um, but yeah, you you have a demo and someone says, hey, I'm looking for an audiobook narrator. And you can say, here's some examples of stuff I've done in different genres. Wow. Do you need a bunch of equipment too? Like that, That's home? where I was going next. Because oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, so, I don't know. I'm going to do a little side. I mean, you can you can certainly do this by traveling to studios, but that would require you to be in one of the major metropolitan areas near Newark, New yeah. Jersey, that sort of thing. Um, it's so much less expensive uh, than it used to be to set up a home studio. Um, wow. I have. Uh, I don't know if I can pick up my whole laptop to show you, but I've got a whisper room right here and some audio equipment and microphones wow. and all sorts of things that that hang down. Uh, so so cool. I, I have a good amount of equipment, but I've been doing this for 15 20 years yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and have acquired all of this it it is very helpful to have your own recording space in today's market mm. um, because in fact if you're talking about acx audible's uh, um, creation exchange yeah they want fully produced audio 
Uh, mm. If someone hires you on ACX to record their book, they're expecting to get sale worthy audio. So oh, you need yeah. professional equipment and you need either your own editing time or hiring out editors to mm. finish the product and make it saleable. Um, and that requires that requires some some gear, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much for breaking that down. Are there any like books or anything that's like a good or or I don't know, like to to check out or something like that? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of voiceover and narration books. Um, I don't Ooh. know what the top uh, are titles now, are right? these days. Um, the, the gentleman I worked with is named Pat Fraley. Okay. Um, and he teaches online these days. He used Ooh. to travel around the country and do stuff, but he does a lot yeah. of online feedback where you read him material and he tells you how to improve and you read it again and tells you whether you've done well on that. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing I'm seeing a lot of coaching these days is online back and yeah. forth. But again, you need some way to record yourself uh, mm -hmm. and a quiet space to record, whether it's a closet or or a, an inexpensive microphone, or a full whisper room, and yeah. all of this gear. Oh my goodness! All right. That's so cool. So, guys, we have gone over the hour. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, but Kenya, before we go, I need you to tell me what you're currently working on and what we can expect from you, because you know <laughs> everybody is chomping at the bit for the next Kenya creation. So I, I'm writing um, a book called Lay. And so it's, if for anybody who's read Dima, it's set in Paradise City. And so it's set in this world. And so Lay is a character that you see in Dima. You don't necessarily have had to read Dima, but it's just a better experience. Mm -hmm. And Lay, um, he's Chinese. He's over this whole like big mafia organization in the East of Paradise and the whole section, this whole space of Paradise is just like really like, it's its own world in itself. I love, like you like fantasy, I love the world building of fantasy. So as much as possible when I'm doing a romance, I try to do a bunch of world building. So I've created this like really like major city. It would kind of probably be like the Chinatown of an area of a city, cause it's so mm -hmm. much, you know, of the culture embedded in there. And it was supposed to only be one book, but now it's a freaking trilogy because I had to put like a treasure hunt situation going. <laughs> I was looking at a lot of Indiana Jones and all this stuff and it was supposed to be one thing. And I was like, oh, but we got to make the daggers and clues and da 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 to get. So now it's a whole trilogy. I am personally at, um, I mean, currently at the, the end of book two. Okay. And I'm now getting ready to start book three. And I'm not going to put the books out until book three is done because I don't want anyone to like. I'm, this is, <laughs> I'm a huge cliffhanger. I'm a cliffhanger <laughs> person. I've given out a lot of cliffhangers this year. I know people are done with me. So I'm like, next this time, all the freaking books, just, you know, set the weekend aside, get all three books read them back to back, have a blast. So that's what I'm working on now. <laughs> awesome. And Eric, any projects that you can tell us about? Uh, I am working on right now the fifth installment of a, a lit RPG. We didn't talk about that uh, particular segment genre. That's mm -hmm. a, you know, it's a RPG role-playing game style uh, yeah. fantasy book that has game elements as part of it. So you're getting system messages. Congratulations, you've leveled up. Uh, <laughs> wow. that, that series is called <laughs> Death Genesis. Uh, and Ooh. I'm working on the fifth one of those. But I will finish off the year with a romance project from DK DeRosa, which okay. is, it is a paranormal a uh, fantasy romance that involves a bachelor style reality show. What? So you've got, you actually have two bachelors. One is a demon, one is a tiger shifter. Ooh. And then the, the series begins with 12 bachelorettes, the whole gamut of fairies and Jesus other Christ. shifters. And there's a, a Pegasus shifter and, you know, all of these different characters. Wow. So 12 or 13 female leads basically that that oh whittled down God. through the course of the series um it's been an interesting challenge to take to have 13 
main leading ladies that yes. I have to differentiate and working with the other go. narrator and, and all of that. So that's been fun. I've got the second know. edition of that coming. I don't even know how, how that was even <laughs> written. That's awesome. Well, congratulations <laughs> for you for being that able is, to do that. Again, busy. Uh, I don't know how you keep them separate. Uh, it's <laughs> lots of notes and sound lots files. Lots of notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody said, Kenya, no more month plus cliffhangers. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I did a lot of cliffhangers this year. Next year, my whole goal, like, I don't know. Do y'all do this where, like, when it's December, you kind of plan out the next year and mm -hmm. figure out what you're going to do? So my goal for next year is an L series, like Subline and Mouse. I'm not going to, I decided I'm not going to end it now. But there's all these different series that I have and trilogies and duets. They're all ending next year because everybody's been hanging on certain stuff. So mm. that's that's my personal goal for 2024. Tying up loose ends, I like year. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the wrap, it's the wrap up year. That's my, thank you, Elle. It's the wrap up year. Yes. All right. And I've got my calendar want... ready to go. Ooh. I'm already, <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm half scheduled already for 2024. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no fair. <laughs> Kenya, if we want to see you in person, where are you going to be next year? Yeah, June 29th will be Chicago with the um, Boozy Book Tours. Boozy book so y'all got to jump on that if you haven't jumped on there. Um, in August, it's Steamy Lit in California. Okay. Uh, September, I have a cruising with KW Cruise where you can mm -hmm. jump on a cruise and cruise with me. Um, October 19th, it's another boozy book tour that's in Denver. Okay. And then I believe that is it. Then I'm going to leave the States again. And I don't know where I'm going after that. Ooh. So definitely jump on those days. <laughs> Man, I wish you were coming to the one in Charlotte. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's no legal weed in Charlotte. Y'all got to figure that out. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I went to Chicago. I went to Denver. I don't know if that connected to California. <laughs> Y'all gotta get legal weed out there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, we might can work some things out, but never mind. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate both of you for joining us and you are helping to extend the world of audiobooks in the IR community and community at large. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have any more questions. I've taken you over your hour, so I will not keep you three hours <laughs> like before. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, Eric. Oh, thank you for having me. And, and Penny, I hope sure. you have a great trip to Japan. Thank you. Yeah. And I will be sure to, because with these new books, I will be sure to mention you, raise your name with Next Deals. I'm Excellent. so Thank glad you. I got to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. This was great. It was awesome happy holidays to you both. Happy yes, holidays happy to holiday. you. And hopefully you'll be narrating one of our books again. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much and enjoy your weekend. Take All care. right. See y'all later. Bye-bye. <laughs>